Access to Banking Committee, March 7th, 2023. Um, we'll start with a overview. Hey, Joseph, nice to see you. Hi, guys. Of the Canadian Blockchain Consortium. Kalea, if you want to introduce it for anyone that doesn't know. Well, thank you all for joining today. Our Canadian Blockchain Consortium uh, we are currently the largest, uh, most active um, kind of ecosystem uh, advocacy group in Canada. Uh, we founded back in 2017 and now uh, support over seven, 73 members in our group. Uh, we have nine different committees, which are access to banking. It's one of my favorites. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, of course, you can come see us at CanadaBlockchain.ca. Cool. Um, I'll do an overview of the Access to Banking Committee. Um, I, I guess our, our intention was to facilitate people having access to financial services, TradFi on and off ramps, to support crypto, the ability to do payroll, the ability to pay vendors, and you know, the ability, ability to, uh, to just access financial services. So... Um, we started kind of last year and our mandate for this year is to drive education and value for, uh, for all members in terms of access to people like we're going to speak to today. So welcome to our panelists. Um, Joseph, if you want to do an overview, I mean, I know everybody already knows you, but uh, if you want to do a brief introduction, that would be great. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ryan. Thank you for having me on the panel. And it's a pleasure to be a member this consortium, a new member, I might add. So uh, so I'm Joseph Seibert, the Managing Group Director for Digital Asset Banking for Signature Bank, which is headquartered in Manhattan, but provides banking services to the cryptocurrency industry uh, globally, uh, which includes an effort uh, in Canada, as well as Asia, Europe, and across the United States. Uh, we service institutional firms that are operating in the space, and uh, are looking forward to you know getting through some of this regulatory clarity that we've been presented with and, and pushing forward in the space as a viable banking option for years to come. Wonderful. Um, also, I still want a signature bank t-shirt. So if you can send have me one at your earliest convenience, that would be great. Um, Sandy, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sandy McGregor, um, and I'm with Connect First Credit Union. So we're a provincially regulated credit union in Alberta, Canada. So I'll just clarify that. Um, and I run our business solutions team. So, um, you know, including kind of cash management and a couple other projects is our kind of specialized market portfolio, which includes some of the higher risk industries. Uh, so my team looks at our, our crypto applicants or anything kind of related to money service businesses. And also, for example, like cannabis also falls uh, within that. So anything weird and kind of scary comes to me and my team. Awesome. It shouldn't be scary, but. Um, and last, um, we have me, uh, CEO of Phantom Compliance. I will be speaking as uh, sparsely as possible as I'm not the expert. I'm largely the moderator in this case. Um, I prepared a number of questions to help guide the discussion, and uh, I'm really happy that multiple people have joined us because uh, it's getting harder and harder to get banking out there. And uh, I can say that I've had clients bank at both of the esteemed institutions that are joining us today. And I can speak highly of both of them, actually, which is pretty rare out there. Um, my ice cream shop is actually banked with Connect First Credit Union. So um, just kind of as an introduction to kind of level set for everyone, I wanted to ask how each group kind of entered crypto and what their first client was. I know my first one was I did credit card processing for a Bitcoin miner in Southern Ontario like nine years ago was my first crypto client. Um, yeesh, I wish I had bought more Bitcoin from them. Um, anybody that wants to go first can go ahead. Ladies first, go ahead, Sam. All right. So, um, you know, it, it's not a, a very exciting story from my end. So the decision to move forward with cryptocurrency was prior to me starting at Connect First. Uh, but from what I understand, the conversation was really around like opportunities with a growing industry. Um, and particularly there were leaders here who were familiar with banking crypto at other institutions. So they supported it. 
And, and I think that's like something I wanted to highlight with this question was from my experience, you know, the risk tolerance stance really comes from the top, like at you know other FIs, it's really a CEO, a president who either supports it or strongly doesn't. And, and you know, we've seen that ebb and flow at other FIs alongside a lot of leadership changes. Um, our, our first client was a crypto exchange. I think it took us over a year to get them across the line, uh, but that's not really the case anymore for, for those of you who are interested. I think so I might know familiar. that, actually. Um, yeah. Um, go ahead, Joseph. Yeah, so really, you know, the landscape was pretty uh, bleak back in 2018 when, when we brought our team to Signature. So we were at a smaller uh, bank in Manhattan where we were managing a large exchange in the U.S. And really, in 2018, the banking sector was was few and far between. I mean, it's still fairly bleak today here in the U.S., but we had really one or two options. It was Silvergate or Metropolitan Commercial Bank, and that's where we were. And essentially, that bank just decided to exit the space uh, really overnight, and uh, we had to find a new home. So luckily, Signature was ready to embrace uh, this space. Our, our CEO at the time, Joe DiPaolo, and our chairman, Scott Shea, were, were very behind us. So we decided to, to move over and then build an institutional-friendly ecosystem where we launched Signet in 2019, which we can get into later. But our first client was another New York company that was into crypto that we had stayed in touch with during the transition. Uh, and you know, to this day, there was like a race to get to who our first client number was. Uh, and these and these guys, uh, they made it across the finish line first. But we were in a position to probably be in a three to four month onboarding process that we shrank down to about two weeks when we got here. So it was uh, fast and wow. furious when we arrived. Amazing. Um, the next question, we're going to speak to it a little bit later in greater detail because obviously crypto acceptance programs are changing every day at the moment based on what's in the news and you know who who went bankrupt this week um but how, you know how has your uh, how has your crypto program changed since you launched and more specifically is that dictated internally because of a change in risk appetite or because people are bouncing checks or is it more like your regulator says hey we only want you to support this under this guideline or this criteria I can start. Um, you know, so um, since I kind of took over this portfolio, you know, coming in pretty green on the crypto side, like very aware of like blockchain and those technologies, but um, you know, these are still businesses. And and my questions and my team's questions and doing the research that we do is always around like, okay, how do we understand these companies as a business? You know, what do they do? Who are their customers? Where do they operate? Who do they serve? I think those were more of how we've changed it and, and looked at how can we compare this to other and, and make other people within our organization understand what these companies are doing. Um, so I would say our, our program has become a little bit more, well, a lot more intensive in terms of that we're involved with the companies, you know, our appetite, um, we gauge our appetite based on what the business is doing, how we can understand it, how transparent, you know, the company is in talking to us. Um, so, and I, I think we've, you know, we've got ourselves to a position where when there's a big kind of, you know, negative news story, we aren't really impacted because we were able to hedge it in a lot of different ways at the front end when we're onboarding some of these businesses. Amazing. So that question comes at a, a very interesting time, a, uh, and what a timely panel this is for what's going on here in the U.S. So it's been a uh, tumultuous few months since the FTX fallout. I think one thing we've learned right away is people were not comfortable with the structure of the organization itself and the experience, lack thereof, that, uh, that FTX had running the exchange. And in hindsight, looking back, of course, everything's 2020, but when you, when you look at this space and how it evolved and how quickly they succeeded, we became numb to the fact that there were still people out there trying to take advantage of the system. So that's never going to go away. So we've really altered our approach uh, twofold. Our, our executive management team decided to uh, make our own decision internally to, you know, aid the process for the regulators in what we call concentration levels. You know, so we were, uh, we're, we're a publicly traded bank with over 110 billion in assets. And we were about 30 
percent of the balance sheet when it came to deposits. And as you just saw with Silvergate, that's really a dangerous uh, path if you're a crypto only yeah. bank. The good news for us, we were not just a crypto only bank, but we decided to curtail that down to 15%. So we won't only want our balance sheet to be exposed to 15% of, of total assets. And I think that's a good number moving forward. Number two, mm -hmm. the regulators obviously are still, you know, jockeying for position, figuring out which one's going to take the lead. But we have to work with several. You know, we work with the, also the New York Department of Financial Services, and they, uh, you know, both have different views on this space. However, uh, the primary goal is to protect the banking system and the consumer. So we've, you know, really taken a holistic approach of how can we de-risk some of the things that we know won't fly moving forward. And that really uh, goes along with VASPs. You know, we really look at the VASPs as your first point of, of entry into this space because everything comes off of that. Um, we, we consider it the octopus of the, the ecosystem. And, you know, if you don't have those um, strong you know, connections in place, you don't have an ecosystem. So we wanted to preserve what we could sure. on the VASP side, but understanding there's a new set of, of rules to play by. So we're now working in conjunction with our regulators to really understand uh, funds flow and, and business purpose and, and outlining activity. I think it's it's it needs to be a clear and purpose definition going purposeful definition going forward. Whereas in the past it was like, oh, I might be an OTC desk, I might be a prop trader, I don't know. Well, if you're handling yeah. client funds, you can't be a prop trader. So there's a lot of defining that we're, we're working through right now, but it's been self-driven. Uh, and then working in conjunction with the regulators. Sure. Um, and off the back of that, I think, you know, you hit on a, a large number of things, which, you know, in terms of acting as a prop trader or moving client funds or anything, um, are you now requiring money transmission licenses for, you know, anyone to access USD or proof of application or any of that? And for anyone on the call that doesn't know, a prop trader means you use your own money to trade where um, if you're doing an OTC desk or something like that, you might be using client money and where you're using client money, you might be required to have a money transmission license. So the reason I'm asking this question in what seems like a belabored way, I always hate the sound of my own voice is, um, you know, we've seen a lot of USD banks saying, Hey, listen, if you don't have an MTL, you're not applying for it. You're out of here. You can't access USD with us. So that's kind of my specific question is do you require MTLs yeah. now for any and all business? Yeah, and we always have. So just to clarify, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of times we've seen, you know, misrepresentation of, of the business model itself. And, and then we get yep. inquisitive. We look at the transaction set and if it doesn't look like it's proprietary funds, it, it sticks out like a sore thumb. So, you know, we, we do require MTLs, we always have, but we're, we're also, you know, trying to, to set the expectation of the ball a little higher. You know, we do have FinCEN, we do have other organizations inside uh, the U.S. that are regulating certain entities that handle client funds. Trust companies are difficult to get your hands around now with regards to what jurisdiction and what state they are really uh, adhering to. But in New York, we have a bit license. Um, yep. So it's pretty simple. If you're a VASP, you need a bit license to, to take New York clients. And yep. uh, if, if I mean, there's only 30, 33 licenses granted, you know, and, and that speaks volumes. So we do take that very serious now. And it's going to be the entry to get in is going to be more difficult, but I think it'll be better for the long run. Awesome. So moving into the next one, I just, this is an easy one too. And I think it might be more easily answered by what are you not accepting? Like, does is anyone still doing an ICO? Is anyone still doing an IEO? Are you supporting NFT projects, staking, any support for anything touching DeFi? Tornado Cash 2.0 just came <laughs> up in the news in the last couple of days, you know? So it might be easier to say what you're not taking than what you're taking, or it might be easier to say, we're only taking licensed OTC and exchanges. I mean, I don't know, you tell me. Sandy, you want to go? Sure. Um, I mean, in preparation for this question, you know, us, it's, it's very case by case. Um, you know, yep. We have to understand what it is that you're doing, who your customers are. Like I talked about that before. We, we dive deep into uh, and, and make sure to Joe's point earlier around like 
what you're telling us is actually what's happening. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so one, you know, something interesting in the Canadian kind of landscape is that, and especially within credit unions, is that we have a lot of partners. Like we don't own the whole back end. We work with a lot of third party partnerships. So something, for example, that Connect First cannot take on right now are ATM based businesses because our okay. cash services provider is a big five bank. And they have, you know, we received a cease and desist saying, you know, we do not want any uh, cash procuring from crypto related transactions passing through our systems. So, you know, as much as I could, you know, take a deep dive and maybe legitimize your business, my partner won't let me. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of one of the ones that we really can't look at. Um, you know, if you are trading funds for clients, you know, for sure you need that MSB license. Um, but interestingly enough, like I think FinTrack in Canada is overloaded. They have no capacity. There are too many people trying to get PSP license, trying to get MSB licenses. Yeah. So we're doing those extra steps in terms of making sure that your compliance program is up to date, because I know that FinTrack hasn't, you know, maybe they gave you a license, but did they really do a deep dive in your program? I don't know. Yeah. Um, I might actually jump in there as well and just say the FinTrack registration unit is less than five people. And since the um, crowdfunding and payment services provider registration requirements, they have been inundated with registration. So I think they're trending in the triple digits for finalizing registrations for a number of days. And also um, we know that other banks that aren't on this call um, required all their payment services clients to register within 60 days or something like that within the last 60. So uh, they're, yeah, they're busy. For sure. Um, sorry, Joe. I'm st I'm stepping on your, uh, no. your opportunity here. This yeah. is an open forum. I mean, you know, uh, that's an easy one too for us uh, ATM companies. But it's not to pick pick on Bitcoin ATMs. It, it's all ATMs. You know, it's it's really hard to get a, a, a AML proper AML controls around cash. It, cash is still the number yep. one instrument to launder money in the world. It's not Bitcoin. So you know, yep. until we we still think about how money laundering works, it's cash. So that's really uh, difficult. Uh, what else is becoming extremely difficult are, are Web3 and, and really anything DeFi. You know, the, the community in digital assets wants, uh, you know, the ability to trust and to get rid of the middleman. Yet when something goes wrong, the community turns and goes, well, we need transparency. You, you can't have both. Yep. You either you pick one. <laughs> um, and that's frustrating for banks because we look like we're not helping. But we have we have you know governing rules to to abide by, and there's reasons for that. Because of, look what just look what happened with FTX. If there was anybody that looked under the hood, from a third party audit standpoint, we we probably could have caught this much sooner. But uh, NFTs, they're also a, a big problem. You know, uh, there's been one company we've worked with that's been fantastic. Their their controls, their onboarding controls are are, are phenomenal. But most NFT firms don't feel that you have to know who your end user buyer is. And that's yep. really dangerous. Very dangerous. Yep. Um, I mean, it's think of it as, as art. Art used to be the number one physical commodity to, to launder money. It's now digital art. And that's an NFT. So uh, we're in the same boat. Got it. Um, I will say on the cash front, too, that um, this isn't just endemic to crypto. And I totally agree with you that it is the number one way to launder money in the world because it's the number one way to transact in the world. Right. Like, it, yeah. I think it's still 60 percent of global transactions are cash based. But um, we were approached by a cash based remittance company recently that is owned by a bank. And I'm still working on getting a bank to take them. So, I mean, if a bank can't get a bank account for cash, yeah. it is a dismal world. Um, I'm limiting us to this topic because I'm a timekeeper. So we're, I think we touched on who is your regulator a little bit, but we're just going to have to move on to keep time. So next, I think what a lot of people on this call um, attending as participants are interested in is how do they get a bank account in Canada, the U.S.? How do they access this for their business and the easiest answer for why the applicants fail is they do the stuff that sandy and joe just said they're not able to do so the number one reason applicants fail is they're outside the risk appetite of the bank but for people that do fall within your yeah let's take an application you know it's it's a narrow field but that's fine um how how do people you know guarantee they succeed and why do they commonly fail 
And if you say it's because they don't work with phantom compliance, I wouldn't be mad at all. <laughs> Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I think the number one reason they fail is, is uh, uh, honestly lack of information, lack of uh, transparency, clarity, misrepresentation. I mean, if you're, if you're going to apply for a bank account, you have to be truthful and you have to be honest. We're going to find out anyway. Uh, and this whole misconception of I can get around the no, you can't. You cannot get around the rules of banking. It's just not, and especially now. Uh, but what we like to do is you know, we have our own risk process up front. So we have an application set uh, and we like to talk to our clients uh, and prospective clients out of the gate saying, explain your jurisdictional funds flow, explain your client base, explain your business model and experience. Experience matters. We had a company yep. the other day fight me on submitting their resumes. I said, they said, why do you do this? I said, well, first of all, we already have your social security number, your address. We have everything. We know everything about you, your passport but you won't share your resume. I find that odd. Number two, we're just trying to prove that whoever has keys to the car knows how to drive. That's it. And if you look at what happened, they didn't know how to drive. Yeah. Great answer. Uh, Sandy. Yeah. And, and like doubling down on transparency, you know, um, it puts the whole concept and portfolio at risk. If I've got one bad apple, it, it like, or whatever that expression is, I forget what it is, one yep. bad one like ruins my bunch. Uh, so yep. you know, you'd be ruining it for everybody if you're not up front. You know, I like to, I like to make sure that, you know, if someone within my organization or outside is asking us about our portfolio, we have the answer. I never want to be caught with like, I don't know, because it, it, it yep. puts everything at risk. Um, you know, and if you're setting yourself up for success, uh, you know, lacking compliance programs. And we talked a little bit about that KYC line, like you need to know your end-to-end -end customers. Um, we, we've seen some companies wanting to work with sanctioned countries or very high-risk countries. Yeah. And with no uh, extra measures in terms of, you know, compliance or, or anything like that. Um, it, it's... <laughs> Uh, we've seen some nonprofits approach us, which is like an inappropriate structure in, in most cases. Um, so it, it's really setting yourself up like a legitimate business and being transparent with what you're trying to do, how you make money, and, and how you're going to operate so we know what to expect. Um, and, and, and I'll add a piece around, again, Connect First is provincially regulated. Like we can only uh, establish relationships with companies that have a material business interest in Alberta. So either you either already have that or you're setting that up. Um, and, you know, there's so many third party suppliers out there that are available to support you. So if your leadership team isn't strong enough or, you know, you're missing some things on your resume, you know, there's ways to bring that into the fold. Got it. Um, my slide disappeared because I'm currently in my office in Pitcher Creek on two different Internet connections. If anyone knows rural Alberta, they're going to know... Uh, the access to internet that governs working out here. So I'm going to add, I guess, a couple items that I wanted to talk about as to how clients set themselves up for success and why they fail. Um, anyone that doesn't know, we do manage a lot of banking applications with my company. And a lot of the reasons that we see people fail is um, they often aren't clear on even what their business does. Um, they don't know their own flow of funds before they apply for accounts and have trouble explaining it. They're not aware that, um, you know, using client funds. So a common one that we see is clients go, okay, I don't have 10 million in capital to settle trades in real time, but I can send a client's Bitcoin to a liquidity provider, receive that money back same day and remit it to the client. They don't see this as being a remittance transaction between three different counterparties that is licensing eligible, not only on the exchange piece, but also on the remittance. It's, it's not even in their brain. So I think I also want to mention Sandy's point about one bad apple ruining the bunch. Um, we often get clients that think, well, listen, I do $2 million a day. Why wouldn't anyone fall all over themselves to have my business? And it's like, well, because we have four to 10 to 20 clients that are, 10 times your size is the reason that we don't, you know, so I, I think often we see people have, um, I guess, a distorted view of their own importance and their own relevance, 
in these instances. And I think they, um, you know, they might try to dictate um, how things go with their bank when they're not necessarily in a position to dictate anything. So, you know, uh, I, I don't often answer my own questions, but in this case, I wanted to answer those. Also check it out, y'all. I got my other internet connection working again and we have a slide again. So how long does account opening take? I'll That's leave a loaded it to question. The boys here are just telling. Yeah. Uh, so you, there's two answers: uh, before FTX and after FTX. Uh, so before yeah. FTX, you were looking at a two-week risk review, and then about a four-week onboarding DocuSign implementation. And that four weeks included getting your credentials, signing on, testing, you know, making sure you're fully operational. So it used to be about a six-week all-in. Uh, right now, it is. Um, anywhere from three to six months minimum. And, and the reason for that is we are, we are basically scaling back on onboarding uh, just any entity, any, any brand new entity that wants to come in. You really have to have a connection to an existing client, account being a counterparty. Uh, not saying we won't take new business models, but we, we scrutinize heavily your, your business model up front now. And that's now going to be in a queue uh, that has quadrupled uh, over the last uh, three, four weeks. Yeah. So um, we're just in that, let's still do case by case, but the timeline has now uh, really gone a little little haywire. But uh, we have to make sure the ecosystem is protected from the counterparties they, they're transacting with as well as the bank. So, you know, again, it's uh, in, this, in this day, long is not necessarily bad. It's just more robust. Got it. Um, the next two questions I think can be combined. So, you know, what kind of probation or transaction monitoring can people expect? Like, obviously we're not giving anyone an open commercial account with the ability to do bloody anything. Um, at least I hope not. And, uh, do you have ongoing reserve or minimum balance requirements? And for anyone that doesn't know, a reserve is where the bank keeps a percentage of your ongoing volume to guard against clawbacks or chargebacks from customers and so on. And I can, I can speak a little bit to account opening as well. Um, you know, our process is very similar, I think, to the pre FTX. Um, if we, you know, 60 to 90 days till you're operating is probably, you know, the, the longest part of some of our processes if we're identifying people who are out of province. Um, and if we don't have a backlog, yeah, same thing, like two to three weeks to, to get, you know, an approval in place or an application in place. And if we don't have more questions, um, you know, probationary and monitoring, like, I, I think it's a little bit a casual in a sense that um, there are no like set requirements, but we are having like regular conversations with you. We're, we're looking at your transactions. We're seeing what's your fund flow in so far. How are you onboarding? Um, and then we'll be asking questions. You know, there's also a meeting with some of our compliance people uh, internally because they want to get to know you. They want to understand your <laughs> program and, and really kind of do that double check and, and introduce themselves from a, a peer perspective. Um, no reserves or minimum balances, but at Connect First, our, our, our uh, pricing, our, our fee schedule is, is differentiated. So that's how we're kind of hedging that risk is that um, you know, there, there are fees that go with you know managing this portfolio and de-risking it and, and, and keeping ourselves on top of it um, so that's kind of where we we draw the line got it okay um great so we're at 10 minutes for this slide so i'm going to keep it moving um maintenance is you know something that i think is always relevant which is like okay like you know the clouds parted uh, zeus favored me uh, inshallah, I opened a bank account. Amazing, incredible. How do I keep it open? And how do I make sure that my bank is happy with my performance and the way that I operate with it? So um, a lot of what we see, and you know, we have clients that transact in Europe, Asia Pacific, etc. A lot of what we see is um, banks want us to introduce a new counterparty before we interact with them. They want us to flag a transaction as being an operating transaction. So doing payroll, paying a vendor, paying a bill, or being a commercial transaction. And, you know, I, I, I know that I might be the only express compliance guy on, on this call as a panelist, but I definitely want to talk about 
kind of how people can ensure they stay on side with compliance um, and just how we can make sure our bank accounts stay open once we obtain them. You know, typically what we're seeing, and this ties into the last slide a little bit, you know, we have ongoing monitoring. You can't, you can't watch every single transaction. And that's a lot of what the, the entire world doesn't understand. You know, when, when these breakdowns occur, no one's sitting there watching every transfer, every wire, every check. It, it's just, you can't. There's, there's systems in place that provide alerts, but a human and, a, and even a bot is not going to be able to alert you fast enough if there's, if there's nefarious activity. But what you can do is take a historical look at the transaction data and say, okay, you proposed X and you're doing Y and Z. Yeah. And that's our most common reason for leading to uh, restrictions or closeouts is you just misrepresented what you were going to do. You were asked to stop doing it. You kept doing it and no one would pay attention. And that, and that goes with high risk jurisdictions. Um, so that's the easiest way. Um, and then the number two easiest way is to just do, uh, you know, if you're a hedge fund and you start to write yourself checks, you know, obviously that's, that's not going to fly either. So it's really a pattern <laughs> of activity we see that is really, it's just sheer, um, neglect for, for what you've been granted. It's a privilege to have a bank account and people don't understand yep. that. I think it's like a driver's license. It can be revoked at any time for any reason. Yep. Um, I, I, I do want to jump in just on your, your concept of it being a privilege. We run into this with clients all the time. They're like, well, if I owned a marketing company, I could walk into Scotiabank and open an account in five minutes. And it's like, well, you don't own a marketing company. So <laughs> I, I don't understand why you think that's your expectation. Yeah. But I'm stepping on Sandy. You can go ahead, Sandy. Uh, um, it, we've talked about it. It's transparency. It's openness, communication. And, and like, you know, I, I'm here to help you too. Um, you know, we've encouraged uh, clients to avoid, you know, sanctioned country pitfalls, uh, you know, how to restructure your funds. Uh, you know, what's it like working with IROC? So again, all this like front loading work that we do and all of your communication and open with, openness with us helps you become even a, a better organization and, and get some of that licensing, the extra licensing that you're looking for. Um, yeah, pre-advising us, or, you know, some part of like our due diligence on front two is looking at your third party suppliers and making sure that most of your, for example, liquidity providers are, you know, within country, are regulated, are, are, are entities that we know. Um, yep. so talking to us and, you know, I, I'm not scary. <laughs> I'm, I'm here to help you. <laughs> Sandy once bought me lunch, just so everyone knows. And the compliance officer for Connect First lives on the same street as the banjo player in my band's parents. So Connect First is a very approachable FI. Um, I can speak to that directly. The last, um, last question on this slide is, you know, what happens when a, uh, a customer recalls a payment or, you know, when there's chargebacks and just for anyone that doesn't know this is when a client you know makes a payment to you and then changes their mind so for example something that happened not with connect first or with signature but with another one of our clients they had a um, a company represent that they were doing proprietary trading they were actually running an unlicensed investment fund in their own country taking in, you know, client retail wires, buying Bitcoin off of my client. And then the people that they ripped off got upset, charged back those wires and their bank in turn charged back their wires to us. So, you know, I, I've, I've gone through recalls with Connect First and found them to be great. So I, you know, put this one in here so you can hit a home run, Sandy. But also I think it would be valuable for everyone to know a little bit about, you know, what the bank expects when there's a chargeback payment and what the consequences can be for you as a person that, you know, has a sloppy fraud prevention strategy or something of that nature. Well, it, it, these are case by case. And our expectation is that you show us, you know, the due diligence that you've completed, um, you know, to prove out that, or, or to tell the story, essentially, like what happened here. And, you know, we need a lot of details to on both sides to figure that out and to work as from with our compliance teams and your compliance teams to figure out, okay, what went wrong and how can we improve this and avoid this in the future? Um, and, you know, restricting accounts, yeah. Uh, wire recalls is probably the number one thing that makes everybody in the whole organization freak out because, you know, I've got people in wire ops who have no idea what you are and are receiving recalls saying that you're fraudulent 
Whereas we know that the story is a little bit more complex than that. And I'm, you know, I'm working hard internally to say like, no, no, it's not our member who's the fraudster in this scenario necessarily. Yep. Great one. Yeah, in the U.S., it's pretty, it's, it's, it's interesting. So we have the automated clearinghouse, which is, you know, an ACH payment that, you know, as a consumer, you have 60 days to, to dispute. So uh, we don't now entertain retail. So we don't do ACH for digital asset purchasing. Uh, and we, we so. make our, you know, wire activity be 100,000 or greater. So it eliminates a lot of the small fraud. But what, we, what we've come to find over the years you know, someone will buy Bitcoin, uh, it, it, obtain it in their wallet, and then go run down to their bank and, and say, fraud, 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 you know, give me a wire recall. Uh, the yeah. good news is the uh, the recall has to be honored by the payment recipient, uh, and they have to yeah. authorize their bank to return those funds. So the wire is usually final, unless there's some type of, uh, you know, litigation. But uh that protects the asset from being delivered, the, the product from being purchased, and then not, you know, making off with cash and Bitcoin. Uh, but the ACH is a real problem. I think that we identified it early on. We, we wanted to support this area of payments, but it just didn't make sense because if you if you look now, the clawbacks are uh, phenomenal that are going through the FTX world. It's uh, everyone that had an ACH is now trying to get their money back 60 day, within that 60 day window. Yep. And I mean, I think you guys nailed something that's really important that changed kind of in the last two, three years is I can remember when we used to get wire recalls before crypto was expressly regulated and all of our accounts weren't coded as MSBs or money transmitters or anything. The bank would just say, well, we think you guys deserve to lose this money because we don't think crypto is real and, you know, you can beat it. And uh, there were a lot of like business ending losses taken back then. And I'm really, um, I mean, it makes my job easier, but it also, you know, give, fills me with hope for the world that we live in to see, to see the recipient banks, you know, kind of going to bat for us in, uh, in these instances. But, uh, you know, if we were here for my opinion, it would just be me on the panel. So I'm going to move to, you know, kind of looking forward and then move us into participant questions thereafter. And I think we've kind of nibbled around a lot of these already. Um, you know, we've mentioned the, the worst three-letter acronym in the industry, FTX, many times. Um, and I can say that, you know, I'm going to use this as a segue into the other questions, i.e. specifically about Operation Choke Point. Um, since FTX happened, we've seen, you know, Joe, you mentioned Metro Bank exiting crypto completely. We've seen other banks, you know, restricting their programs or upping the barriers to entry for application and so on. So, I mean, I know we've touched on it a bit, and I know that both of your institutions do really enhanced, robust due diligence and application, both prior and post. But have there been any specific changes, i.e., you know, no related party transactions, no wires being credited that aren't a name match to the account holder's name or any of these things. Has, have any of these changes happened? And, you know, maybe you're not the right people for granular questions, but what can I say? I'm a curious guy. No, I can share. We've had some public news out there, you know, Kraken and Binance, who are obviously uh, in, the, in the news a lot more than most exchanges. You know, we, we had to... Uh, minimize our exposure to their retail footprint, which was uh, comprised of overseas and domestic here in the US. So we put in a new limit, again, of $100,000 minimum, uh, what we consider retail. So any anybody transacting to buy any type of digital asset from one of those exchanges or through an OTC trade, you know, we won't accept that under $100,000 any longer. We used to, uh, but that's one massive change we made and uh, it actually eliminated the U.S. derail for finance.com uh, and then gave Kraken kind of a new outlook on how they view retail with their banking partners. So that's one massive change we made. But Operation Choke Point's been in the news. Um, I think they're focused on uh, a particular set of exchanges. And, and by set, I mean three. Uh, and I think that if they can prove their... Uh, controls, their, their policies are, are sound, audited, and being followed. 
I think you'll, you'll see some fines and we, and we move on. If uh, the investigation uncovers a lot more, you know, who, who knows what to expect, but um, they are not telling the banks to stop. They're just saying it's going to be a much harder approach for you to get in if you're not in it already as a bank supporting this. So we're doing everything we can to, to have longevity. And we want to work with both regulation and this client base because we, we do see it has a future and our, and our bank is definitely investing resources to, to get to the future. But the next six months is, is ultra important here in the U.S. Uh, we need some of this yeah. uh, noise to calm down uh, and we need some, some exchanges to really step up and, and show that their controls are, are being followed. Uh, go ahead, Sandy, if you want. You know, I, I would say the, the only thing we'd add here, you know, if, if we think about the Canadian landscape of who's allowing, who's open to, to banking these, right? It's, it's all of the smaller entities. Yeah. Um, so we look at, you know, as we, as, as our programs grow, like we have to watch our exposure in a sense, and it doesn't even have to be to the portfolio as a whole. It could be even just exposure to single entities, right? Like no, uh, no credit union wants to have like 50% of their deposit book you know, with yeah. some of these entities. So, you know, we, you might see some pushback from some organizations being like, you're too big for us, or we don't even have the capabilities to be able to support you. Um, so yep. I think that might be more what's playing into, especially if we see some exits, you know, some money kind of moving around, like we might not even be able to say yes all the time, depending on, on what that looks like. I think that you guys both uh, mentioned something that Sandy was actually really informative to me a time that you and I were talking about, like you were talking about how much it connects first business was auto finance and how profitable auto finance was for your FI and how it, you know, how like you couldn't, you know, endanger that line of business by having your crypto business take up too much time or resources or be too much of your deposit book. And I think one of the things I wanted to achieve with this panel and one of the things that I want to achieve, you know, as often as possible in life is just removing people's blinders so that they can see like, you know, this FI doesn't exist just to bend over backwards for you. It doesn't matter how good your business is. It doesn't matter how profitable your business is. And it certainly doesn't matter what opinion you hold of yourself. You need to work hard, pay your dues, demonstrate value, and, you know, frankly, not be a pain in the ass. Um, 43 minutes into the call, first time I swore, new record, <laughs> but, um, you know, that, that's how to make sure that these accounts stay open. That's how to make sure that your bank doesn't hate you. And these are basics in life, but I find they get missed in, uh, in crypto a lot. And just before we move into questions and final thoughts, I do just want to say for anyone that doesn't know, Operation Choke Point was a U.S. federal a uh, program that limited access to banking for high-risk industries like pornography, firearm sale, payday lending. A lot of it was motivated by the predatory payday lending that occurred, you know, a decade plus ago. And there's been a lot of usage of Operation Choke Point to uh, refer to any of the banking changes in the U.S. So, you know, Custodia being denied their charter, Paxos being indefinitely delayed, Metro exiting crypto altogether, multiple smaller programs changing their acceptance and making it so if you have a PO box or virtual address anywhere in your corporate structure, you can apply. If you don't have money transmission licenses, you can't apply. If you have a nominee shareholder on that Maltese Corp you opened five years ago to sell an NFT, you can't apply. These, these bars are here now. So Without stepping on final thoughts and question period, I'll open to the panelists to kind of wrap up where they think, you know, access to banking and, you know, state of banking and crypto is. And then we'll get to as many questions as we can before we finish on time. Yeah, I would say we want to look forward as an institution and we need to come out of this uh, together. And I think the, the crypto companies and the banks that are, favorable to the space need to work a lot more closely to provide transparency. And, and as you said, don't be a pain in the ass, be supportive, be understanding of why we're asking these questions. It's not because we just want to intrude. We, we need to know, and we need to explain, you know, not a, to, to this day, nobody knows a lot about how this funds flow moves and we have to constantly explain it. 
So if we can't reach out to you for explanations, it's just going to continue to keep us in the rearview mirror in the regulatory uh, world of not trust. And we need to get to a level of trust so that we can build regulation and legislation and move forward. Right. And I echo that completely. Um, you know, help us tell your story. Help us tell the story. Really, uh, we get a lot of questions uh, from other people within our organizations. Ask us, what are you doing? How do these companies work? How do you how do you make sure they're not criminals? Right? Like people ask us that, and you know, we go to bat for you every day, saying like, this is what yep. they do. These are who they are. Uh, this is their backstory. Here's how they started in this. Like those are the types of good news stories that we need to bring to the forefront to battle. Kind of the negative news and negative sentiment. Yep, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, I love that everybody echoed my don't be a pain in the ass. Uh, just while we're on the call, I had a client messaging me that they didn't want to pay a $2,500 application fee to open a bank account. And it's like, come on, dude, number, you're breaking the number one rule. Um, one thing I also want to say with regard to how we manage applications now, um, I've been doing, you know, access to payments, access to fiat on and off ramping for crypto for a really long time. We actually require everyone to clear an audit with us before we'll even walk them into a room with a bank. And we won't put them in direct contact with that bank until we're super confident they're not breaking the number one rule. Because uh, if I have to come down to my relationship with Sandy and Joe or my relationship with any backwater client, uh, you know, I've got a nice bunch of apples. I don't need a rotten apple in there. So with 13 minutes to go, and we were all skeptical that we were going to fit all those questions and content into under an hour, and we made it. Uh, congratulations. I would open to, uh, to questions from anyone. I know that there have been a couple in the chat uh, let me see. Um, what standards are you using in general to make a decision on whether to onboard a new client or member? Um, I, th I think we might have covered this um, already. And one one item I wanted to say as well is, you know, we're seeing crypto clients still struggling with implementing travel rule solutions. Um, we're seeing industry struggle with information sharing and so on between each other just to say okay sandy said bitcoin to sandy we can, we can say it's a closed loop sandy to sandy we also see the industry struggling to hit sock two um just you know for lots of different ones so i mean i think we hit on standards but if i'm missing anything you know guys feel free and also lots of banks and TradFi institutions are not sock two compliant and have zero plan for it so it's not just crypto I mean, the, the biggest piece I can say is be, be, you know, cognizant of the licensing you're required in the jurisdiction you're in and the changes that might be on the horizon. You know, people are unaware sometimes of they form an entity two years later, they think it's the same set of rules. It's not. Uh, you have to be constantly aware uh, of, of, of your banks and what they're comfortable with uh, accepting and what they're not accepting in that jurisdiction. You know, set up a solid company. Really, like all the things that we're asking for, you know, you, you have to be incorporated, you have to be registered, you have to know, you know, you need people, great people on a team, you need a team. A lot of people yeah. looking at this to take over all the different roles. Um, I would say that the stand, there's no standards because each kind of business is different. But if you lean on the business edge of how you've set up your company, I think, I think that creates a lot of that baseline that we're expecting. Great answers. Um, Kalea, do you want to open it to live participant questions or do you want it to be in the chat? How would you like to handle the last 10 minutes? No, we can totally open it to, to live. Um, so for any participants, all you have to do is just uh, raise your hand and I can uh, allow you to talk so you can have an interactive conversation. Crazy, no questions? That just means you guys were so amazing at explaining everything, there was nothing left to ask. So, I mean, I'm... oh, go ahead. Sorry, there's a question here on shortening timelines. Um, you know, we move as quickly as you do. So if we're asking you for, or can you provide like X, Y, Z, the faster you get it to me, the faster I can look at it. 
Um, you know, we've seen a lot of delays with, you know, people taking two weeks to get back to us with an application form or with a registration proof or different things like that. So you want to, you know, yep. we've had an approval happen within five days because we got all the documents within 24 hours and we didn't have a backlog. Yep. Great. And shortening timelines right now is probably not, uh, <laughs> probably not going to work. Yeah. I mean, yeah, asking a bank to go faster when you're lucky that they're even looking at your file and replying to you is breaking yeah. the number one rule, right? Like, uh, so what we often find is clients want the ability to pay rush fees or they, you know, they want to be noisy and have everyone pay attention. And it's like, you know, we all have a lot going on. You catch more flies with honey. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not aware of any bank that is moving faster than a month right now and that's a hard fought 30 day timeline when we achieve it and like sandy said it's only when the applicant has everything together um yeah it's it's rare maybe one more question if if these are standards then why are so many fi's not following suit um I have my own answer for why other banks aren't wading into, you know, supporting crypto, but I'll go last. Uh, I would say too many, too many risk components, too much money to get in and too much pressure right now. And that's in the U.S. I, I think that some of the banks are on the sidelines waiting and, and seeing for the next bank to get in. But, you know, we need regulatory framework and we need legislation until that occurs, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna have three or four banks that support uh, for the next three years. Yeah. Yeah, I would say it has, it has a lot to do with the resourcing. Like we have built standards, programs. Like we have people dedicated to this. Um, I, I think that, uh, and, and you know, the, it, it cascades into other teams, right? Like our compliance teams look at this. Our our legal teams look at this. I think there's a lot of hesitancy to dedicate that many resources to one industry segment. And you see that a yeah. little bit with cannabis too. Suddenly all the banks had to bring in, you know, pros and there's still some banks that don't want to bank a, a completely regulated product. So um, I think it comes down to, to resourcing plays another role. And then, you know, just lack of understanding or, or, or risk tolerance, just being like, no, it's too complicated. I'm not touching that. And in French, yeah, you think- <laughs> I, th I think you hit on what my answer was going to be, which like there's a few different schools in like the traditional approach to compliance. And one of them says no to everything. And if and when an executive overrides them and something goes well, great. And something went well and they're not responsible for it either way. If and when an executive <laughs> overrides them and it goes poorly, they were right. And if no one overrides them, then there's no risk to their FIs. So, um, you know, what, what I will say, like, and I'll spare as much personal comment as possible, a access to, to, to traditional finance in Canada, period, just personal banking or anything is super restricted, not very open, not very world leading. We still don't have IBAN infrastructure. We're still using email we don't have a Venmo, you know, we're, we're all still acting like uh, Interact is like on page with SEPA or faster payments in Europe. And if, if our banking access just for individuals to access loans, um, home purchase and, you know, small interest is behind with regard to the rest of the world, why would we expect our crypto acceptance to be on par with it? Um, and anybody that's on here from my bank, I love you. Uh, I love my bank account. Please don't take my comments to heart. Uh, every, all the FIs that support Phantom and our clients are, you know, market leading and we're glad to have them. But I think that we're hitting on a common problem, which is an expectation that we deserve banking and that it needs to be up to our standards. And frankly, that's a flawed viewpoint. So if we're expecting other FIs to follow suit or we're expecting better options, I would encourage us to do the best we can with the ones we have now. Sorry, uh, that's, that's a big topic for me. I get animated on that. Um, uh, okay, if there are any other questions, we'll handle them. But otherwise, 
you know, I, m- I might set a one minute limit for further questions and then give everyone four, three to four minutes of their day back. Um, in terms of closing remarks, I do want to say that it was like real personal pleasure for me to, uh, to host this panel. I, I like everybody that participated in it and uh, I really like the subject matter. So uh, it was fun to spend time with everyone today. And if no one has any further questions, I will close this panel and uh, wish you all a fantastic Tuesday. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, Colette. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.